What is good, everybody? Thanks for being here on another InsideCarolina.com podcast. This is another episode of The Throwback. I'm just your host, Joey Powell. Appreciate y'all joining us today. Uh, with me today to talk about the 1996 season opener, Carolina football against Clemson. Uh, it happened in 1996. We've got Tommy Ashley and Lee Pace, two guys who remember that game very well. Uh, we're going to run through that and kind of hopefully remind you guys of what was a really, really awesome afternoon in Keenan Stadium, a balmy day from what I could tell. Uh, and just want to tell you guys how much we appreciate you being here. Uh, all listeners and viewers, if you're checking us out on YouTube, uh, please make sure you follow us, follow Inside Carolina. Uh, if you're not a subscriber to Inside Carolina, you're missing out on just about everything. Uh, but make sure you rate and review this podcast. It really helps us out. So take a second. Tell us if you like it. Uh, Five-star reviews are amazing. If you don't like it, shoot us a quick email. Uh, let us know that you don't like what's going on. We'll try to give you better content. I will try to be better. That is my commitment to you, the listener. And want to give a shout out to Johnny T-Shirt. We'll talk a little bit more about them a little bit later. But uh, always sponsoring the great content that we put together for Inside Carolina. And they are huge supporters of ours. So we love them. Appreciate them being along for the ride. But guys, 1996, uh, Tommy Ashley, Lee Pace. Tommy, how you feeling? Man, I, it's hard to believe it's been 25 25- years ago since that ball game and uh you know lee's the expert but just re-watching the game uh <laughs> over the last few days 45 nothing you think well how's blow out from the start it was a much different ball game than i remembered uh, from from looking back that far but yeah it, it is certainly relevant it was very relevant then it's certainly very relevant now 25 years ago man that's a kick in the pants lee how you feeling man <laughs> Oh, good, uh, Joey. Thanks, thanks for having me on here. Uh, yeah, quarter of a century, uh, quite a long time. But um, you know, th that game was was so significant for Carolina football and and Mac Brown's you know volume one career at Chapel Hill. It was the kickoff to yeah. I kind of break that those ten years that he had here from eighty eight to ninety seven, kind of into four different eras. There was the uh, you know the first two years of just plugging the dike. <laughs> um, re rebuilding the offense one year, the defense the next year. Uh, the next three years or four years from 90 to 95 was proving that they could win and they that, that they would win, uh, which they did. 94, 95 was kind of a transition era of uh, um, tweaking the defense and the, the defensive mindset of letting the kids that they had recruited after having shown that they could win, which was a different level, than they recruited at the very beginning, just letting those kids evolve and then making the decision to go in a different direction offensively by hiring Greg Davis from Georgia to run the West Coast offense. So you had a lot of things coalescing. Clemson had been a thorn in the Tar Heel side for two decades, having won 17 games over 20 years of the previous years. And uh, Clemson was going through a little bit of a stumble up at this time in the mid-90s itself with uh, – Tommy West with his five-year run. So a lot of things coming together. And then one thing that really stuck out at me watching the game was, was all the clay and the dirt at the, uh, the left side of the screen uh, over in the West End because that was the, the year that the, the, the West End expansion, the Frank Keenan Center was being built uh, over the course of the 96 season. So just a lot of things going on in this game. I love that you mentioned that uh, in, in some of my notes kind of setting up the game. And I'll, I'll help set the scene for our listeners and, and viewers uh, it was the season opener. Uh, if I remember correctly, and guys, correct me if I'm wrong, Hurricane Fran came through right after this game, right? The very next week. Yep. That's so, right. Syracuse, yeah. uh, when Carolina went to Syracuse one week later, uh, they traveled uh, during the aftermath of uh, Fran. That's right. Um, it's something I learned during the, the rebroadcast via, via commercial from ABC. Tiger Woods' pro debut would come this very same weekend at the Greater Milwaukee Open. So, again, if you want to feel old, just think about that. Um, <laughs> and then I also had a note that the Keenan Football Center, as Lee just mentioned, was just dirt and cranes at this point. So it's, it's really cool to look and see how open everything looks. And then when they cut to the, some of the all-22 looks, you can see that giant pile of dirt and a couple of cranes and some, some diggers. But uh, resetting the year before, uh, you know, Clemson has just hired – Daryl Moody from Chapel Hill, who we know now as part of Mac Brown 
Uh, UNC had lost to Clemson the year before, 17 to 10. Uh, five interceptions, I believe, between the quarterbacks then. This was a, a, a debut from a kid that I had uh, – well, he's not a kid anymore, but at the time was a kid um, – that I had on a throwback in the past, Chris Keldorf, joining the Tar Heels from Palomar Junior College out in, uh, out in California. Uh, I remember North Carolina returned almost all of their offense uh, with the exception of the quarterback. And then the, what I really want to start talking about is how slick and deep and fast – this defense look I mean this was you know I love your frame Lee when you talk about kind of the four divisions of that first run for Mac Brown at this point he's got the Ferrari and you could really see it in this defense Lee what jumped out at you rewatching this game about uh, about the the actual players the Jimmys and Joes on in the Tar Heel Blue well the most significant thing was the fact that uh, from the very first snap you had Dre Bly and Robert Williams lined up face to face hands coverage on Clemson's uh outside receivers. Uh, 96 was also the arrival of Ron Case as the secondary coach from LSU. And in his last year at LSU, they played press man coverage 75% of the time. And he wanted to be able to do that at Carolina when he got here, but wasn't sure. But during spring practice in 96, he saw Williams and Bly and what they could do and, and knew they could play it. And that was just a totally different mindset because Carolina had you know, always kind of been known as fly the friendly skies of Carolina. Um, <laughs> they're just, they're not very good in the secondary. And they early 90s started the, the rude boys mantra and uh -huh. starting to get good, but they still were fairly soft in the secondary. They were getting better athletically, but with Dre Bly, Robert Williams and Ron Case, it, it just totally changed the mindset. And that plus you had the horses up front. You had Greg Ellis. You had Bonnie Holiday, Michael Pringley, Rick Terry, uh, Russell Davis, all those guys up front. It's some great linebackers. So it all coalesced in just a, a remarkable two-year run of defense where the, where the Tar Heels gave up an average of 11.5 points a game, 215 yards per game over those two years. That'll definitely get it done. Uh, I love that you mentioned uh, Dre Bly and, and Robert Williams off the jump because I think the first pass play – uh, Clemson's quarterback, Nealon Green, threw. Dre had a really, really good read on it, broke on the ball, and was playing man coverage you know, from the line uh, and, and knocked it away cleanly, which is not something you expect to see out of a true freshman and would be a great foreshadowing of, of things to come. Tommy, what do you remember the first time you went back and saw this again? How did the, how did the actual dudes on the field jump out at you? Look, when you got Greg Ellis covering punts <laughs> – you know, that's what I – I mean, it's incredible that you've got that amount of defense. Uh, you know, go back to the Sun Bowl in 94 where Texas came back and won, and legend has it uh, that Mac said, we're going to do something different on defense or, or people are going to be switched up. And they went to the aggressive style defense and is recruiting over that time frame to get those guys. I mean, when I'm watching, of course, the pads are bigger back then. The neck Huge. rolls. You neck got rolls, the, pads, shoulder pads are <laughs> as big as, as – car hubcaps yes and you've got um a linebacking court as as intimidating looking as carolinas and they could play and they could run uh, the announcers on that game talked about the side to side speed and all but i think and lee talked about it and you hit on it too i think what signified the serious change of carolina under mac uh, the first time around was dre Bly and robert williams they changed the game when they can cover one-on-one, -on -one, it allows Omar Brown to run. Uh, Joe Malegans was out there to run and, and make plays. But Bly and Williams being able to lock down those corners for Cle or those receivers for Clemson, I mean, it's like feeding frenzy for the front line, for the front seven for North Carolina. I remember Carolina's always had some pretty solid defensive linemen, but they could always go over the top and throw the ball deep on Carolina and, and run it when they had to. This game showed me one thing, and I said earlier it was a very different game. Clemson could do nothing, and Clemson got some gifts, turnovers from Keldor for early one, and could do nothing running the football. And, you know, I know the announcers talked about Clemson's turmoil and all that, whatever. They still – you know that those guys had to be shocked that they simply couldn't get a running game going. And that was the difference. And then when you throw in Bly and Williams – 
it was certainly, you know, and this is probably premature in the show, but watching that game again and then knowing how that season played out and this, the season subsequent to that, it makes me wonder what life would have been like in Chapel Hill had Mac carried forth because what he was building there figuratively and literally with the building in the end uh, was something special to watch going back 25 years ago. Joey, really one, you, Joey, one thing to follow up on your comment on that play with Dre Bly early in the game. If, if you notice on the film also that he popped out of there and was celebrating and raising some hell after the big play and Mac Brown grabbed him and, and read, him a, read him the riot act. And, and Dre will laugh about that. And he talks about that mentality even today that that, uh, you know, Mac Brown is no different 25 years later in that, you know, you're going to make a big play, but you're not going to celebrate and you're not going to showboat and hot dog like that. And so that was a significant element of that. And, and Tommy, you mentioned the, the Sun Bowl in 94. Go back one game to the Duke game at the end of the year where Carolina had to pull out a, nine, a 41 to 40 win at Duke. Mm -hmm. That was the, uh, the, the key turning point. There was a kid named John Jensen, a Duke receiver who just ran nuts all over the middle with just little little short ding passes that Carolina couldn't stop. And that, add that to the Sun Bowl, that's when Max said, we've got to change things up. And they started building toward that in 95, and it all came together in 96. Lee, I appreciate the nod uh, again in my notes. I had uh, at 429 in the third quarter, Dre Bly murders a wide out after a catch. He is, uh, as the kids say nowadays, lit. And then your point, Lee, Mac grabs him by the collar and absolutely gives him a few choice words. Mm -hmm. I think that's neat because knowing what we know now about the relationship between those two guys, Dre Bly and Mac Brown, and mm -hmm. knowing what Dre Bly now means to the program uh, with Mac's resurgence, do we feel like, you know, you mentioned that Dre still talks about that. Tommy, what did you feel like seeing that and you're knowing what we know now? Yeah. Foreshadowing, right? It, yeah. it, you're going to do it. You're going to do it like you're supposed to do it, but you're going to do it right. And you're going to do it with some class. And Bly was flamboyant back then. I mean, you could see it returning punts early in that game. Leopard don't change his spots, man. Exactly. And, and he's the same way now, but the respect that he got from – early on from Mac Brown has built what he is today and it's built that relationship and it's why today he can recruit like he can and and do it honestly he doesn't have to guess or, or doesn't have to assume what Mac Brown thinks and how Mac Brown works he's lived it from day one at Carolina and it's paid off today it, it was fascinating to watch because you see a lot of guys and and I'm I'm old but I'm still like <laughs> I enjoy to see some of the celebrations but sometimes it's over the top and watching Dre back then, it could have gotten over the top if yeah. it wasn't reined in and Mac did that. And, and yeah, I mean, it's all, it, it all runs together over the last 25 years to what it is today. And it was fascinating to watch. Um, Lee, I love the comment you made introducing you know, the rude boys concept because it was starting to show uh, the, the beginnings of it. The seeds were starting to sprout at that point. What do you think we can draw as parallels now between what we saw in that game from Dre Bly, uh, the you know, young as green as he could be uh, freshman playing, and now what we see as Dre Bly, the defensive backs coach, and the recruiter and the coach? What do you think the parallels are, and how much did you see in this game of what we know now? Well, I think it always goes back to recruiting and how good are your players. I mean, we all love to talk about X's and O's and schemes and halftime adjustments. But one thing just from, from following Mac's program beginning in 1988 um, is that it's, it's all about recruiting. Uh, it's all about how good are your players. And here was a man who was obsessed 24-7, 365 with recruiting and bringing the right, right guys in. And the first couple of classes, all they could sign were kids who just bought into the vision, who were in-state kids, who always wanted to play at Carolina. Then they had to prove they could win. Once they proved they could win, then they were able to get yet another level of player. And those are the kids that evolved into the players that uh, were, were now sophomores, juniors, and seniors in 96 and 97. So, 
you know, we, we love to talk about scheming and X's and O's and all that. And I just did earlier and talk about the West Coast offense and being more aggressive on defense. That's fun to talk about, but it still goes back to how good are your players. And that's what we're seeing, seeing Mac is doing now. Uh, Mac and Dre and the entire staff is they are loading up on in-state players. They're going out of state selectively. They are recruiting against Alabama, Michigan, uh, Miami, just the, the juggernaut programs. They are starting to limit the outside programs coming into the state, although Clemson then, as always, is going to be an issue. But it's, it's always about getting the right players, then developing them. And we're, we're seeing that happen already now. So it's volume two of Mac is the same as volume one. It just looks a little bit different. And Joey, let me chime in here. When Mac, Bra when Mac got there in 88, I don't want to say he burned it to the ground to start it back. But he cleaned house in 88 and 89. I mean, I was there from 89 to 93 observing it. And I had some friends on the team that did not make it under Mac Brown 1.0 in 88 and 89. So from watching it uh, play out from on campus, it was bad going 1 and 10, 1 and 10. But you could see, and like Lee said, he's selling a vision. And at the time, there was no results to, to <laughs> know. So he sold – uh, his plan and it worked and it was able to build forward flash to now he's doing the same thing he just started on a, a little bit better plane and and pushing forward so you know you've got a coach who uh, you know a lot of coaches you and I could drive a Ferrari pretty fast right Joey I mean we might wreck it eventually but even a well-oiled machine will run by itself for a while without any attention Mac came in and started off with nothing and then ran off a fair amount to start to do it his way. And it, you know, that 90 game against Georgia tech when they tied the eventual national champions mm -hmm. and then building up to here, 94, 95 seasons were okay. And then like we're talking about this game, it sort of kicked it off into the next level for Carolina at the time, which was a huge leap compared to where it had been. Um, and that's why I think it's relevant, and we can talk more about it later. Today, the levels are different, yeah. but the jump could be as significant. Listen. Well, one, one thing I think, guys, it's fascinating is, is, is Mac followed Dick Crum the first time. He followed Larry Fedora the second time. Both his predecessors, outstanding coaches, had great success at Carolina at different levels. Mm -hmm. um, great men, no hint of scandal under either one, ran – Great programs, solid programs, but for whatever reason, Carolina had become not the cool place in both the Crum era and the Fedora era. And one thing Max said that still resonates, every time we sign somebody new or get a commitment from somebody now, I think back to his introductory press conference, and he said, we were the cool place in the 90s, we will become the cool place again now. And that is exactly what's happening. You can see the momentum. Momentum cuts, guys, a wide swath in both directions. And we were in an, an awful negative downward swirl of momentum at the end of the Crum and Fedora eras. And Mac has turned it around and now in a great upswing of momentum, both times uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, and now in 2021. So I, I love that this is the direction you guys are taking this in. So let's talk about the the actual um, the actual depth that you are beginning to see. So so Lee Lee framed it, and and Tommy did a good job talking about how he kind of uh, nuked the landscape. And then you know uh, Lee talked about the first two years you're rebuilding, then you're starting to sell kids on a vision and showing that you can win. At this point, he's got the depth, he's got buy-in, and look no further than the guys that played on the defensive line in this game for Carolina. And, and when they list the starters, you know, it's, it's, it's somewhat impressive. I mean, you see the starters tried out there uh, on, the, on the defensive front, Greg Ellis, future pro, Vonnie Holiday, future pro, Mike Prangley and Rick Terry and Russell Davis. I, I, I think uh, Davis started instead of Rick Terry, but by the time you watch the game, and this is, again, this is what jumps off the screen at me when I rewatch this. You saw guys, Andre Purvis. You saw the aforementioned Greg Ellis. You saw Rick Terry. You did see Russell Davis. You saw Tito Simpson getting some play. You saw Vonnie Holiday. You saw Mike Pranley. I think there are one or two other guys. But, again, what overwhelmed me was, wow, this really is uh, an, an eight 
or a nine-man uh, defensive front that's getting real burn in this game. Is this the first time that we're starting to see what Mac wants it to be? Uh, Lee, I'll go to you first. Oh, sure. Uh, you know, that Carolina has not been this as good at the defensive front in 25 years uh, as it was in 96 and 97. Uh, some glimpses of it under Butch Davis uh, came real close to it. Uh, John Bunning's first year when uh, the Tar Heels had Julius Peppers and Ryan Sims and a couple other guys were sort of close to it. But but now they're, they're coming back and you've got to have the depth. You've got to have the strength and conditioning. You've got to have the program to keep the kids healthy. And one thing, I, I was just astounded looking back at the starters in the 96 season. And this is this works on offense as well. Mm -hmm. You've got 22 starters on both sides of the ball. Over those two years, no, over the 96 season, nine positions on defense, on offense, had the same player start every game the entire year. And two of those were just one off. Uh, that was uh, Chris Keldorf missing the Gator Bowl at the end of the year because of a of a broken foot, and I think Russell Davis may not have started one game. Um, but, but other than that, you just had that consistency. You had the depth and you had the consistency, and those guys playing together game after game after game, and you're not having to pitch and, and put a patchwork lineup together uh, is, was so important over those two years. Tommy, what jumped out at you about these guys, other than the fact that, one, they were huge, and two, there was a lot of them? And to the point about starting every game, it's because they didn't have to play every game, all game. Right. Uh, like we, we refer to Crawford and Strobridge um, a couple of years ago all the time that played um, combined more stat, snaps than the entire defensive line for Clemson did that year. Uh, I mean, so Mac was able to do it. Yeah, I, it was fascinating to watch. I mean, Tito Simpson made a play. Mm -hmm. That's a name I hadn't heard probably mm -hmm. since then. You know, and he was out there making plays. Look, I've said it before, I'll say it again, and I repeat myself often. The defensive line is where you win in college football. You have to be good and you have to be deep to play with the big boys. Mac knew it then. He showed it in 96 and then 97 um, and some in 98 um, when he had left that those, those defensive lines were as good as any in college football. And to be able to run nine guys out there, eight, nine guys out there. And then not only that, I mentioned it earlier, have defensive linemen covering punts because they had the depth to do it. And he wanted his best players on special teams. The man gets it. He got it then. Um, you know, Clemson didn't know what had hit him. That's what I took. I mean, Tommy West, uh, we can talk about his coaching ability, but he looked lost. And the whole day. And it, well, so one thing that jumped out at me, I love that you pointed that out. Uh, uh, he wasn't wearing a headset, so I have no idea who he was talking to or what he was doing. But every time the camera panned to Tommy West during this game, he had this look of the, the forlorn uh, beaten sea captain who has just lost his boat in a hurricane and has no idea what he's going to do next. Because he's just walking around with his hand on his face, uh, and just kind of doesn't really seem connected with what's happening. And all right, so we've reset the entire defense of UNC. You know, linebackers, I think, were Streets and Smith's best position group uh, preseason of the year. We talked about uh, the young guys in the back. We talked about the depth of defensive line. So the final score was 45 to nothing. But we got to at least acknowledge the guys that put up the 45, right? So Chris Keldorf coming in first game, um, as I mentioned, coming in from, from JUCO, you've got uh, a new – a uh, new offense under Greg Davis. What we saw was a little bit of pro style, a little bit of traditional eye, but those West Coast concepts. Lee, did you do you remember Chris Keldorf being? And again, he wasn't flashy, and they're not throwing the ball forty five times a game like you see now with offensive offensive uh, schemes and game plans. But do you re did you remember Keldorf being as efficient despite his pick and despite the what should have been another pick in this game? He looked efficient this game. Did you remember him being that efficient uh, before we came back and, and rewatched? Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. That set the tone. And uh, I remember that first pick, which was a bad one, just thrown over the middle right in the hands of a, of a Clemson linebacker, I believe it was. Uh, Greg Davis, and, and this was the first game that uh, Greg Davis and Chris Keldorf had, had worked together. So this was a, a big game for them for that relationship. And 
later Greg Davis said that he was he was interested in what Keldorf's reaction would be on the headset after he threw the pick, mm. whether he would be pissed or whether he. Greg said that that, that Keldorf just said, "My bad. I, I, I mean, I, I missed the read. Uh, that won't happen again." And so Davis said that he just felt really comfortable after that. And and what, what Keldorf did, ironically, he threw that bad pick. But what you would see as the year went on was that he didn't make those kind of mistakes. And, and Tommy mentioned it, or somebody mentioned earlier, the uh, interceptions at Clemson in 95. How about Mike Thomas throwing the three interceptions at Maryland in 95? You know, 95 was just an interception ravaged year. And that's one of the reasons, you know, Carolina had a little bit of a slip that year. But in Keldorf, you just had the cerebral nature. You had the good decision-making ability. He was not a particularly good runner, but he was an accurate passer. And then, as we later found out, you had the gazelle in Oscar Davenport coming on. And so, 97, the next year, would be a one-two punch of, of Keldorf and Davenport playing. And But it was – um. You know, everything in the early 90s, once Florida State came in the league, Mac Brown will tell you today, every decision they made was based on beating Florida State. And they saw what Florida State was doing with Charlie Ward, uh, throwing the ball around, uh, livening it up, and that's what they had to do. And 96 and 97, if you go back and look at it, Carolina doubled up yards gained passing over yards gained rushing back to back those first two years. And that was unheard of in Carolina football history. So the, the, the die was cast in 96 and 97 that they were going to open it up. They were going to start to find L.C. Stevens, Nay Brown, those guys, um, use their tight ends and Freddie Jones a lot more. And still you had the running game with Leon Johnson. And, you know, Leon Johnson, returning guy who had kind of turned down, had, had spurned the NFL came back looked great uh, I love the uh, the ABC announcing crew just kept hammering the natural nickname for Leon during this game but uh, Tommy one of the things that jumped out at me in, in this game again was was Keldorf's presence as a pocket passer but he wasn't a stiff and I think a lot of folks may not remember that I remember it was a play early in the game he looked to his left to throw a uh, kind of a snap screen and then rolled back and moved the pocket back out to the right which was something I don't think people knew that he had in his bag. Did you remember Keldorf being um, a guy that was capable of, of not just standing back there and, and planting his feet in concrete? He, uh, he moved better than I remembered thinking back. You know, he, here it is from a, a fan perspective way back then. Carolina, um, it, like Lee said, it was a little bit of a slip. And then you've got this guy coming from California um, that they say is good, but he's never played a D1 snap. He's a junior college guy, which is not a big thing for Carolina to have. And, and then you see him on the field and his presence. I mean, the, it was a big boy out yeah, there. And he was, able, he was able to move just enough. Um, and you got to give some credit to the offensive line. I mean, def Clemson wasn't as good as they've been over the years, but their defensive line and defensive front was able to give Carolina some problems. But Keldorf was able to move and, like you said, roll it just enough to get time to make some plays. He was far better than anyone expected. Now, winning this game certainly set some expectations way, way up there. And for the most part, he lived up to it. But, Joey, I can't get away from thinking, watching this game, and I don't mean to divert off Keldorf, but Leon Johnson was such a stud. I, I mean <laughs> – He had a lot of shake to him, didn't he? He was uh, – you know, if you'd have told me back then that he played, you know, 10, 12 years in the league, made a, made a lot of money and was just one of the best um, all-purpose backs in the league, I would have said absolutely. And how that – how it all works out is always strange to me. But Leon Johnson, man, what a talent that they had. And he was kind of – he shared it with Curtis Johnson at times. But he – such a fascinating watch. I would love to see – you know, he's like a Javante Williams but bigger back then. Well, and I, f I always felt like he, at least watching this, uh, reminded me of how quickly he could get to top speed. And, it, and uh, again, I get the natural nickname because he was – he looked he looked as if it was effortless whenever he did anything he did with the ball in his hand lee do you do you remember much about how leon uh started his senior year? i think he only ended up with with 
800 or so yard and I say 800 like it's like it's nothing but uh, he finished the season with 913 yards on 242 carries but in this game, he broke it out early. Do you remember Leon being as, as much of a, a home run hitter once he became the guy and wasn't splitting carries? Yeah, and, and, and remember, Leon was a quarterback in high school, so he had that speed and that running ability. And I remember a preseason scrimmage, I guess it would have been maybe before 92. I think he was re- redshirted in 92. Um, he was running with the scout team in an August scrimmage and just made an unbelievable play. And everybody was just kind of whispering, like, who is this guy? And that was kind of when Leon, um, you know, laid the gauntlet down and showed people what he could do. And, and, and early on, he, he shared time with Curtis Johnson and, you know, the infamous Johnson and Johnson twins. So that was a lot of fun. So by 96, he had the show and, uh, uh you know, just emblematic of the, the type of kids that, that Carolina had at the time who were totally committed, uh, who came to school for the right reasons, stayed four years and got their degree and went on and had a successful career and went on to become great ambassadors for the program. Morganton Freedom's own. So shout out to, to that locale on the North Carolina map. All right, guys, let's get into a couple more things about the game specifically, and then we'll, we'll wrap this one up. Uh, L.C. Stevens kind of had a coming out party. I think you know, they talked about UNC on the game, UNC not having a lot of proven guys uh, at receiver. And despite uh, the announcer, uh, Mark Jones, making the, the mistake a couple of times to call him Octo- Octavius Brown, um, Octavius Barnes was, was hurt or was coming back off of a knee reconstruction. And L.C. Stevens really seized his opportunity. Lee, uh, L.C. being, a, you know, being a, I guess, a harbinger for things to come, uh, really, really looked good connecting with Kildorf as if they had been, you know, uh, thrower and catcher for a long time. Yeah, he was the prototypical uh, uh, split end, uh, a flanker type. He, he had the length, he had the speed. He was kind of a, a, a new element to that West Coast offense. And yeah, I, I featured this game in my book on Keenan Stadium, Football in a Forest, as being the premier um game of the 1990s just because he was so important and one of the pictures I was able to find from one of the local papers just showed LC on his 45 yard third quarter touchdown run where he is going to the east end zone and the photographer was in that end zone shooting back toward the west end zone which as we've talked about was just the 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 construction site and there's just a handful of Clemson players just splayed out on the ground in his wake. And it's just a, a great photo. And, and we use that, you know, in a large format. And it just kind of, to me, really, really set the tone for the game and, and what a dominant uh, game that was for Carolina and, and L.C. Stevens. Um, if you can't see, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. Uh, I'm trying to find that, that, uh, that picture, but my, I'm not as quick uh, archiving through it as, as probably the author is. But uh, – Tommy, do you remember? Uh, do you remember L.C. Stevens looking as freakish as he did in this game? I mean, the dude had two big time touchdown catches. Both were long bombs. He had another one that he dropped in the end zone, uh, lost it when he hit the ground. Uh, but yeah, like Lee said, six. There's that photo. Yeah, it's yeah. Clemson guys are way behind him. That photo Lee's got that he's showing on the screen right now for our YouTube viewers. I mean, he essentially left uh, two pretty good guys in the dust, and when he caught that ball you know, that picture does them some justice since it makes them look a lot closer than they actually were if you were watching from the press box. Tommy, do you remember uh, L.C. Stevens kind of being the stud that he showed out in this game? Yeah, I remember him being, I mean, just, you know, that picture kind of shows it. I mean, a big man playing wide receiver and, and had the speed. And it's not something that um, Carolina fans were really used to, to have somebody that, that big to be able to run. And you're right. He he was able to get separation, um, and if he couldn't get separation, he could overpower these Clemson backs. And he did it all year. I mean, he had importantly 17 and a half um, per catch that year for Keldorf and, and Davenport. You know, it's fascinating to me to see the difference in how offenses have changed has have changed over the years. I mean, we're talking about this West Coast offense. And <laughs> Greg Davis is going to come in and they're going to put up huge numbers. And at the time, it was there were huge numbers for Carolina. 
But Keldorf threw for 2,347 yards, had a great season for Carolina that year, did everything he was. They'd be saying he had an awful year, or did he play half the year? It's just the difference in expectations. But these guys sort of started setting them for this Carolina team these days. And LC was a big part. Don't forget Nay Brown. I mean, Nay Brown was – uh, he allowed LC to get deep a lot yeah. of the times, especially in this game. And then you had, you know, Freddie Jones, another monster. I mean, Keldorf had an embarrassment of riches. They weren't big names at the time. They be, they become bigger names. And then you got Octavius Barnes that, like they kept saying, is coming off an injury. Had a, a, a you know, an okay year off an injury. But yeah, it, it's LC was a guy. You know, LC is a – you get a 6'4 guy that can run, and that's a problem even today, and he certainly was that day <laughs> for Clemson. Yep. Big dude, uh, big hands, absolutely bodied some guys. Uh, you're trying to catch uh, trying to catch some toss-up balls. Uh, again, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the guys that put up stats in this game. We talked about Keldor. We talked about Leon Johnson. Chris Watson had a few carries. Jonathan Litton, who you saw catching the ball out of the backfield, that would be a – kind of a, a preview of what he would do uh, before his senior season in Chapel Hill. Uh, you mentioned uh, Freddie Jones, who would go on to have a great career in the NFL. I forgot how big and often they used him attached to the line of scrimmage and pass plays and would just have him run what's essentially a, a, you know, a 10 yard go. I mean, straight off the line. That was amazing to watch guys. I'll hit you with this before we, before we try to get out of here. Play of the game in your mind. Lee Pace, I'll go to you first. Well, I would take, uh, you know, Dre Bly and Robert Williams making the big breakups early in the game. That's, that's pretty that, that, easy. That, that set the tone. Absolutely. I think it's – it. like you guys said earlier, it showed that UNC had some stability on the back end that they, they weren't going to be thrown upon, even if Neilon Green, who I felt like that day could not throw the ball, you know, in the ocean if he was standing in a boat. But – uh, yet I digress because a lot of that had to do with the defense. Tommy, play of the game. Uh, Omar Brown's hit on third and two <laughs> after after the first um, <laughs> LC Stevens touchdown. They made, I think they made it 17, t uh, 17 nothing. Clemson gets the ball back. Um, and then things still, went sideways. Yeah, it's still a game. And then they have a third and two, and Omar comes out of the backfield or, or comes up from the defensive backfield to stop a toss or an option. And then it was over. Uh, there, like I said, defense is my thing, and that once that happened, that game was over. They they had some thumpers. That that's a great point because it it was after the touchdown that it got really loud. Uh, and then when when yeah when Omar Brown came up and and, and busted this play wide open, that uh that really set the crowd uh, a frenzy. Which again, it was kind of cool to see. Uh, a, a just about capacity Keenan Stadium, knowing how hot it was and knowing that, you know, they didn't have the enclosed stadium that we have now. The fact that it got so loud on TV, you know, kind, kind of made you think, what if? All right, guys, parting shots before we get out of here. Lee, your overall kind of sense about what this game meant, not only in, as you broke up, not only in the four stages of Mac 1.0, but what did this game mean as a whole for Carolina football, for Mac Brown, and maybe even for, you know, does it have anything to do with, with what we see now? Again, it was a season opener. It did set the tone for a season. Well, it was, uh, it was a statement game. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, it's, it's why I featured this game as the, as the premier game in Keenan Stadium in the 1990s. Uh, it, 96 and 97, arguably, were the finest two-year run back-to-back -back in Carolina history. Uh, you, know, you can make an, L, an argument 80-81 were pretty stout with Carolina winning the ACC championship. It's last in 1980, but um, um, I, I think the offense had evolved in 96 and 97 to be more, more diverse and more varied than what Carolina was running in 80 and 81. So it just uh, it, it, it set the tone, um, and it was a, a great era that ultimately helped get Mac Brown the job at, at Texas. You know, you could have, you, you can, of course, sit back and say, well, what would he have done had he stayed at Carolina? And who knows, he may have developed a Dean Smith type career. But I think going to Texas was the right move for him because it's a job he wanted. It was an, it was a 
football intensive school that he wanted. Um, so I, I think he made the right decision and, you know, the, the gods have smiled down on it and he comes back and has a, uh, a second go with Carolina. And, you know, just as he was chasing Florida State in the 90s, now he's chasing Clemson and uh, getting a little bit closer year by year. So I think things are set up now with, with the offense and the defense finally getting back to where we want. I've, I've said many times people uh, are, are gnashing their teeth this year over Carolina what they lost at running back and receiver. I think the offense is going to be fine. The difference is going to be defense and kicking game. That to me is what the 2021 season is going to be all about is defense and kicking game. Sure. I also, I want to point out at the end of this game, again, knowing what we know now about the run that Clemson football is on with Dabo Swinney and the titles that they've been able to, to win down there. At the end of this game, the announcers actually had the gall to say something about, well, now North Carolina needs to worry about, are they running up the score and, you know, sports and chip, et cetera, et cetera. I found that to be somewhat ironic and, and quite tasty considering <laughs> where we sit here in, in 2021. Tommy, parting shots about this game, your thoughts as to how it feels within the annals of, of Carolina history. I think Lee did a great job of giving a historical perspective from Keenan Stadium, but how, how do you feel about it? Yeah, you should let me go first because I can't, <laughs> I can't Sorry about follow that. Mr. Pace, but Matt Brown, his first tenure, um, I think there were three statement games. The 90 Georgia Tech game where you tie the ultimate or the uh, future national champion. The USC game, the real USC game out in California um, where they put a thumping on them. And then this game. Those were the three. I mean, they sort of go in the same thing Lee talked about, the stages of Mac 1.0. you have to make statements to everybody around that we're here. And I think Matt, when he came back to Carolina, and I don't even like to think about what would have happened if he had stayed. Those, <laughs> those, I think we, I, yeah, I don't know. Who knows? Let it go, bro. Let it yeah, go. Yeah, exactly. exactly. But I, I think when Matt got back to Chapel Hill, it sort of awakened what had gone to sleep. Bobby Bowden always talked about sleeping giant, whatever. I'm not going there, but it sort of, reminded the people at Carolina that are still around that football is king, even though basketball has been the thing for Carolina for years. And had those, had that mindset been here in 97, 98, who knows what would have happened. But now folks realize, and Max uh, done a great job of impressing on people that football is the way. I'm reminded about, and we talk about money and finances, all that. A friend of mine is going to, his son's going to Alabama. They went down there for his visit this past, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Everything is brand new. Everything. Even in this day and age of financial troubles at times, everything's brand new. And he asked the building supervisor for why. And he said, because we've got so much money because of football, we don't know what to do with it. So we just build new stuff. That's how Mac Brown um, has been able to get folks in Chapel Hill now to understand. Oh, I think we'll see that resurgence. I think we'll see that continued effort to make football number one. Max showed it back then. Then you got 20 years of a dead period for the m- most part. And now here we are. I think that Clemson game and this Virginia Tech game coming up um, Labor Day weekend, I think they're very, very similar um, in the the arc of Carolina football, and we'll see what happens in September. And Tar Heel fans would definitely love to see uh, a similar outcome as they saw of this season opener back in 1996 in Keenan, though uh, the 2021 season opener will be on the road in Blacksburg. Uh, I want to give a huge shout out to Lee Pace. If you have not, please get your hands on some of Lee Pace's books and his works. Um, the man is not only a golf writer extraordinaire, he has done – football in a forest which you saw a second ago uh check it out on your screen lee we're in this what second run of those yeah did a second edition um 
uh, just last year. It came out in June. Yep. Um, so I've got, uh, I showed you guys a second ago. I've got a copy of that. It's a phenomenal book. It's not just a coffee table book, though. It's beautiful enough with the photography and the, the insert visual pieces that are in it. It makes a great coffee table book, but there's just a ton of knowledge and Lee's been following Carolina football and covering it for the Tar Heel Sports Network forever. You'll hear him during games as a sideline reporter. Uh, and also uh, another project that we talked about on Inside Carolina Live, Tommy and I did, First Pass. Uh, I was lucky enough to do a, a little backstory project that Lee was helpful on. Uh, but talking about the day that uh, the first pass originated in a North Carolina football game. So make sure you check that out. Uh, Lee, are both of those available at Johnny T-Shirt? They are, yeah. Okay, so Johnny T-Shirt, johnnytshirt.com. Absolutely. Uh, make sure you check them out. And while we're talking about Johnny T-Shirt, you know – we love them. Tommy loves them. Lee loves them. Go pick up these two books because if you're a Carolina football fan or you proclaim to be, I'm going to check your credentials because if you don't have either of these two books and here's first pass, uh, if you don't have these two books, I'm going to question if you're really a Carolina football fan. Go to Johnny T-shirt, Johnny T-shirt.com right there on Franklin Street in Chapel Hill. Pick up your copy of the second edition of Football in a Forest or first pass. I promise, I promise, I promise you will enjoy the reads of both of those. While you're on some vacation, it's a good thing to take along with you. Plop down at the beach or at the pool and go through them. Uh, first pass is a quick read, but very, very good insight and knowledge and some bits that I didn't know, um, and that doesn't say much, but uh, you'll learn something. And then, again, Football in the Forest, just an absolutely breathtaking read. It's just beautifully done, an amazing project. Check that out. Johnny T-shirt, johnnytshirt.com. You know – as an Inside Carolina Premium subscriber, you get an extra 10% off. So hit them up. We love Johnny T. Appreciate them sponsoring the show. Uh, boys, why don't we put a bow on this? I'm going to go talk to uh, a player that had an impact in this game Shh, right after we get done with this. But uh, last words before we get out of here, Tommy, you got anything you want to tell any, any of the people that you've got worked on uh, other than your amazing uh, Inside Carolina radio show that you do in the fall? Uh, we uh, we are looking forward to a, another great Carolina football season, covering it for Inside Carolina, doing these radio shows, talking to guys like Lee Pace, and getting that knowledge brought to everybody that listens to these shows. And it's look, it's an honor for me to be on this uh, this show 25 years ago, half my life ago, to sit here and talk about Carolina and Clemson in 1996 with Joey Powell, but especially with you, uh, Mr. Lee Pace. I appreciate it. How easy is it to bring a guy like Lee on the show to make us look so smart? Yeah, I just sit back. I should have just sat here with a drink and let's see. <laughs> you see how I work. Lee, uh, <laughs> anything else you want to plug before we get out of here and let folks know what you're working on other than getting back to the sideline this fall? No, uh, George, uh, Tommy, I appreciate uh, you guys having me on. It's been a lot of fun uh, going back in memory lane. I'm just looking forward to getting back, hopefully, in a mask maskless environment with uh, 60,000 fans in Keenan Stadium and other events and getting back uh, into a more normal environment uh, and a lot of fun to come in 2021. Yes, sir. Well, for Tommy, Ashley, for the venerable and knowledgeable and you know, the guy that casts all of the knowledge onto this episode of the throwback, Lee Pace, uh, I'm just Joey Powell. We appreciate you guys joining us. Stick around. Uh, we've got another part of the show that you won't want to miss, talking with one of the major contributors from that defense. Uh, but once you hear that, you'll know what I'm talking about. But this has been uh, the throwback on InsideCarolina.com. Talk to you in just one second. All right. Thank you all for sticking around here on this episode of the throwback. Episode two of season two. We're talking about the 1996 season opener against Clemson, which was an absolute just skull dragging uh, in, in Chapel Hill at the hands of the Tar Heels over the Tigers. And right now, Back from Dirty Jersey, number 91, Mike Pringley, one of the defensive linemen who, if you were like me rewatching this game, you saw 91 jumping right off the screen at you along with the rest of his D-line mates because, as we talked about with earlier with Tommy and Lee, this game absolutely was a coming out party for what would be an amazing run of D-line success. Mm -hmm. And so first off, Mike, how you doing, man? I'm blessed, man. Thanks for having me on. Um, it's been a, you know, it's been a roller coaster as far as uh, these last years, you know, since leaving UNC. So it's been, um, I still, like I said, still came in touch with a lot of the guys, but um, still a proud, proud alumnus, man. So um, proud to be a Tar Heel. Well, I want to. That's a. That's a, actually a. Uh, I think a good segue for us to get into this. What was the first thing that came to your mind 
when, when I reached out to you about being on the show, what was the first thing that came to your mind about this particular game against Clemson in 96? Well, with this particular game, it was, it was big because it was the opening game. Normally you don't play a game of that magnitude that early on. So we knew going into that game that it, it would, we, we knew we had a good team based off of last year's team, you know, um, I think we were, I forget the record, but we lost like four or five, but we, we, we knew going into this, that season that we had a chance to be really, really good. And we knew if we, with this particular game, it was going really kind of set the tone. Cause I think we had, we had a rough, we knew we was going to have a tough schedule, mm-hmm. but we knew if we were, if we could establish ourselves that opening game, we didn't know it was going to go to that extreme you know with that with, with the way the score and everything turned out but we knew if we can set the tone for that game that it was going to be really huge as far as us going through the rest of the season yeah what was if you can remember what was prep like for this because I know you know you've got spring ball you've got fall camp where you're basically just working on fundamentals then you start doing some install when you got to those last weeks, maybe the week leading up to Clemson, what was the prep like going into the season opener? Because as you said, you usually don't have a game of this magnitude right out of the gate. So what was prep like for this game? Well, one thing about us that we kind of learned about each other early on, you know, we, we, we base ourselves off of classes. I call, we call ourselves, I'm the 94 class. So we all got nicknames and we call ourselves nine quad. You have uh, the 95 class, nine live, the, the 93 class, they call themselves nine trace. So we have, uh, 92 class and nine dudes so we 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 kind of established a, a brotherhood that's just how it carried on so we knew kind of how good we were so we were really loose going into that week I mean because we kind of in the back of our mind we know we had put the work in we know we prepared well but we we knew that we were good like we mm-hmm. we knew a lot a lot of people didn't know but we knew Mac and then Mac is the ultimate 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 motivator as far as like um not allowing you to he wants you to be confident and, but he don't want you to be overconfident and cocky to where you start making mental mistakes stuff that you don't you know routinely do in practice rep over and over again but he wants you to be confident and and and, and but respectful one thing about Matt he wants you to be confident respectful and just play hard play the game hard fast um explosive power mad dog our strength coach Man, let me tell you something. Mad Dog. I love a good Mad Dog story. Mad Dog, let me tell you something. When, when, when it was time for a cold red, and we call cold red when, boy, when we coming out that tunnel, getting ready to explode with that smoke and everything coming out. But we knew if we can get through what Mad Dog was putting us through in that weight room <laughs> and, on, and, then that, and then that sand pit and then them hills and running around that daggone campus and on that daggone turf with the steam <laughs> coming off that turf, uh, um, 100 and some odd degrees and, and him hosing us down like some cattle. Uh, <laughs> you know, if, if you can get through that with Mad Dog, let me tell you something. Come Saturday at 12, 1 o'clock and it's 100 degrees out there in Keenan, that was easy. That was a vacation. So if you That was to- easy. That was, that was, that was showtime. That was, that was the, that was the, the let out the fresh, the frustration that you just went through all week. So yeah, that, that was, that was, it was time to perform then. We had a bunch of performers, so we was ready to roll. I, I absolutely love a good mad dog story. I've talked to oh, some of the in the past, but uh, I love how also how you mentioned, you know, coach Brown being the, the motivator that he was, I'm sure he let you guys know and had you thinking that Clemson was, you know, the the 1986 bears or something. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah the one thing about coach Brown now, cause you know, obviously Clemson, you know, really good program, but they've always had a good program. Clemson, mm-hmm. obviously, they they've been doing really well now, winning championships. But you know, the, the, the name Clemson, you know, just like you know the Florida States out there, mm-hmm. it still carries a a, a, a lot of weight. Mm-hmm. And we were still, you know, quote unquote, uh, basketball. You, you know, we were still a basketball right. university. Uh, don't know, you know, them, them boys down there with the powder blue helmets. They don't play no football down there. So, you know, we, we were probably the Citadel from, from what everybody else probably thought with our, with way we, our <laughs> uniforms look. But, but, but yeah, so we, we, we couldn't take anything for granted because we had a lot, we had a lot to prove because like you say, you know, when you think University of North Carolina, 
and I knew this before I, you know, when I got recruited coming down here, you think of uh, Dean Smith, you mm -hmm. think of Michael Jordan, you think, because one thing I, I when I'm from being from New Jersey, you know, I grew up a Giants fan. Mm -hmm. So I was a big time Lawrence Taylor fan as well. But if I mention University of North Carolina up in New Jersey, the first thing they're going to say is Michael Jordan, Jordan. and Dean Smith. Yeah. They don't never know, say Lawrence Taylor. They So yeah. they have no clue. They know Lawrence, but they don't know what he can really play ball at. So, so we knew we had a lot to um, prove. But like I said, we knew that it was going to be the it was going to be a changing of the guard. Like we were going to set the tone for this to, to be a football program, not just a football football program, not a school, yeah. a program. So it's a lot. It's a big difference. So we knew we we, we can make this. This can be a special a factory type you know place. We can be on there with the Clemson's. Florida states, you know, and, and, and those, those type of schools there, we can compete with them and, and beat them. You know, this was, uh, you're absolutely right. This game. And one of the reasons we want to talk about this game was not just because we're looking at a, a, a similar situation with Mac Brown 2.0 going to Blacksburg, the first game this year, mm -hmm. but this game being a season opener against a brand like Clemson allowed you guys to put your stamp of arrival, I guess, for lack of a better term, to, to say that, hey, 95 wasn't a fluke. We are getting better. Help me understand when you're talking about, you know, all the guys that you guys had in your class, but also on that defensive unit, because it was, it would end up being one of the better defensive units we've ever seen in North Carolina. Help us understand how such a talented group of guys work together, because it was, it was at every position. I mean, you guys right. had, had young, you know, red shirt freshmen starting in the, in the back four in this game. And then you had so much experience in the front seven. Help us understand how such a talented defense works together. Uh, you know, coming out of the gates, first game of the season. How do you guys know what to, you know, how to, how to just make each other great in the first game of the year? But, you know, in, it was very, in practice, it was very competitive. So being that you had guys um, at every position, whether it was first team, second team, it, it didn't matter because you knew that if you were off your if you were off in practice it was another guy that was going to come in mm -hmm. and pretty much take your place just like that so guys were already on their um their best as far as performing in practice because they knew you can lose your job mm -hmm. anytime and coach brown did not care who played he did not care if long as you doing what you got to do to earn your scholarship and you're performing, that's who's going to play. So he didn't, he didn't have time for the feelings. He wasn't worried about your feelings. Mm -hmm. He loved you to death, but let me tell you something, whoever is performing is going to play. So we challenged each other um, on the defensive line or, or, or in one-on-one -on -one pass rush drills. Uh, you know, we challenged each other, you know, and we we all wanted to be the best. We all wanted to get on the field and play. So, and, and, and the thing about this, everybody on that defense, everybody, even a lot of the um, backers, had a, had played either played in the NFL mm -hmm. or or was on, was in an NFL camp. Mm -hmm. um, almost, almost all the whole defense had some point a shot either played or was in the camp in, in the NFL. Which is, you know, which is unbelievable, man. So um, I was just blessed. I seen Coach Brown probably maybe uh, he had his Mac Brown camp, football camp, uh, mm -hmm. probably a couple weeks ago. I was over there and um, I spoke with him then. And, uh, and I was, and I, and, I, and I can say it was just a blessing to be able to play with those guys. You know, you're talking about Rick Terry, Vonnie Holiday, Greg Ellis, Russell Davis. Even Marcus Dow, he played, he got shot the Bengals. Andre Purvis, um, uh, um, Nate Hobb, good chitty, God bless his soul. Um, Brian Simmons, so Kay Mays, you're talking about uh, uh, Robert Williams, Dre Bly, uh, Greg Williams, who's the assistant coach right now for the um, um, Arizona Cardinals right now, DB coach. Um, Joe Moleggins, you know, you talking about guys that um, Brandon Spoon, he didn't even start. He, mm -hmm. he was a, he was he a was, freshman. Keith Newman wasn't even a start at the time. He was just because he was behind James Hamilton. Mm -hmm. You're talking about guys, man, the, all these guys. Well, you, so just the, the, as far as just the, the challenging to one another, everybody holding everybody accountable. 
see that that's the thing so you could not fake it in practice you couldn't fake it because if you weren't any good it was going to show well, it I'm was sure, going to show <laughs> and i'm sure your, your, your brothers on that side of the ball if you were slipping a little bit your brothers on the side of the ball were going to let you know about it too oh yeah that, that let you know about doing the game that's, that's rick, T, rick terry was a prime example of that yeah, I can't. I can't say what I want to say on, on here, but if Rick Taylor let you know, <laughs> hey, 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 man, you need to you you need to do what you're supposed to doing out there. But he gonna say it to you in a different way, you know. So, man, but Marcus Jones, even Marcus Jones, and Marcus Jones gone prior to that game. But Marcus, um, you talking about a guy that was just flat out. I never seen nobody like Marcus. Scary. Jones. Scary. I never seen anything. Coming out of high school, I, hung, I, I was around Jones a lot. We we went out a lot and stuff. I don't know. I just connected with Jones. But Jones was one of those guys. I mean, when you when it came to the weight room, I mean, this guy would warm up with 415 pounds, like a warm-up set. You know what I mean? I've never seen a guy that big, that strong, that gifted. Um, Marcus Agile. Jones was unbelievable. Yeah, Marcus Jones was uh, unbelievable, man. Unbelievable. He just wasn't very – he was – he wasn't very flexible, which w- w- he was, but he was st- so strong, it didn't matter. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But yeah, so it was a pleasure, man. It was a blessing, man, working with them guys, man. So at what point, and this is kind of a, this is a little bit of a tricky question, but I think you're going to connect with what I'm, what I'm trying to set up here. At what point did you guys on the sidelines, all those guys you just named, you know, NFL players everywhere in Carolina Blue, at what point did you guys feel like you were going to handle Clemson? So at some point in the game, y'all realized that, Neil on green, whoever they were lined up against. At some point, y'all realized, okay, new quarterback, Keldorf spinning the ball. We're picking passes off. We're getting to, to Neil on green all day. He can't move the ball. They can't do anything. At what point did it click for y'all and just said, oh, no, this is getting ready to get ugly for them? Well, see, the big talk was because, you know, Priester, Raymond Priester was the guy coming in. Yep. You know, um, the back. Them. I, remember, yeah, I remember him, Priester was the guy. And we knew he's like, if we, if we stop, we stop the run because we're going to take take the run away, and then we're going to make, you know, we're going to make them try to throw the ball, which is n- n- not really what they were pretty much known for really doing. Because sure. they wanted to get downhill. They wanted to run it. They had them big offensive linemen um, coming off the ball. So um, we knew when, when we got a few stops, okay, I remember when we got a few stops on them uh, opening game and we when we tested that, because we all, what we, what we used to, what we always used to do as a D-line on the first series it don't matter what game it was. Mm-hmm. We call it testing the offensive linemen. So when we when we take that initial dump and then feel what they're coming with, after that series is over, we come to the side and say, "Oh, them boys is weak. Them boys is soft as cotton." So keep, keep so going with that. Knew, so we so when that when that initial when that first initial series normally happens, and mm-hmm. and, and, the, and we come to the sideline with that. Everybody light up. Dude. It's like the all oh, yeah, man. They them boys, them boys soft. All that stuff y'all seen on film. Nah, this 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 here is about to be a, a misunderstanding today. So it, it's uh, um, <laughs> yeah. It, 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 so that from that from that point on, we already knew hey, they they came they can't really move the ball on us, man. So and defensively, we had a we had a different type of uh, attitude, and it showed in practice because it was times that it got so bad in practice that. Mac Brown would not let the first team defense sometimes practice against the offense because we just it would just mess everything up. So it got to that point during my career where it was like, hey, you know, it, we can't even get nothing done on offense. So <laughs> it was one of them type of things. So we knew as long as the, if the offense, because we got Leon back. That's it, man. I think Octavius was a little banged up, but it, we knew if we could put up some, we could put some points up. They not they're gonna have a hard time scoring on us. They're gonna have a hard time scoring on us because we just kept. If you if you notice that game, every we were rotating like crazy. We Y'all probably right. played about I nine counted, guys. I counted ten defensive linemen. Nine, nine or ten guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Tito Simpson. He, oh, Tito. Yep. We played so many guys. We stayed fresh because it was already hot. It was blistering mm-hmm. hot that game. But um, we 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 just kept the rotate even in the de- interior. We just kept it fresh. So it was like yeah, it's going. It's going to be a long, it's going to be a long day for them. I love that fact that you guys, you talk about testing the offense and then, you know, it, it, it took you just a couple of series and all of a sudden you guys are making plans to meet at the quarterback on the sideline. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a nice touch. I think 
something that, I, like you said, I remember there being just a really strong rotation. I counted 10 guys when I rewatched it that were, that were getting, you know, mm-hmm. getting solid reps from the defense. So I, I want to go a, a little bit farther, you know, and, and going back to that game, y'all were stout throughout. It took the offense a little bit to kind of start clicking in the third quarter, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the floodgates opened. So help me. Uh, so last question before I let you go, but help me understand this game, like you said, with all the expectation going into it, you've got an entire off season of prep. You're going against a name brand. You're getting everybody's attention. You've just absolutely just clobbered them on TV, 45 to nothing. Yeah. You know, their coach is over there scratching his head, looking completely lost on the sidelines. What happens after that game in the locker room and in the next week of prep to where you guys are able to use this game to set up what ended up being one of the most successful seasons that North Carolina football has ever seen? Well, we, we wanted to, we wanted to win it. We wanted to win every game and we wanted to win the national championship. I mean, we felt like at that time that we can really compete with anybody, you know, and, you know, and I, I we didn't have the most explosive offense, mm-hmm. um, but we were efficient and, but we, we, we took everything. It was almost, it's almost like that, the, the, the mentality at the Baltimore Ravens or the, um, you know, Buccaneers had when they, when they played, we, we, we put everything defensively. We put everything on ourselves. We was like, man, look, if they don't score, they don't win. If, if, if we can hold, you know, that's just the bottom line. We, we offense didn't worry. Gets 20, the offense gets 20, the defense will win the game. Well, yeah, but we stayed out of that. We, we didn't, we wouldn't, we, we didn't chastise each other back and forth. We stayed out of it. We want, we want, we needed to handle our business, be as dominant as we can. Um, and give ourselves a chance to be there at the end, no matter what game it was. But we we knew we we knew, especially after that game there, that, man, we got some we got some cooking here. We just need to keep grinding, keep playing, you know, stay out of trouble, do what we got to do in the classroom, mm-hmm. make sure you get able to get on the field, and 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 we're gonna be just fine. And then as you can see, I think we went ten and two that year. Mm-hmm. And, and matter of fact, we should have went. I mean, the Florida State game was a, was a tough game. I can't think of that score, but I know we, the VA game, we pretty much had that game won. Yeah. And I think that's the interception. I yeah. think that's what changed everything around. Because we hadn't still ain't won, hadn't won in Charlottesville. We were going down the game we should have won in Charlottesville. Yep. And uh, I'm still sick to this day. We got to talk about that one another time because that, that game made me sick as a dog. I'll bring I'm some. I'll bring some trash cans dog. and a lot of uh, a lot of Pepto Bismol and. You just and don't this, the feeling from that game is a whole nother issue. But uh, and then the next year, obviously, we went eleven and one, mm-hmm. and uh, once again, lost a tough game to Florida State, and I believe that was a thirteen. Was that uh, what was that game to Florida? State? We lost a ESP. That was a mm-hmm. uh, prime time game. Judgment night. Judgment night yep. number six. We I mean we had them right where we want them, but we just. Hell, for everybody we had on defense, they had on defense. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> so still a game. We that was a. Those. But I'm gonna tell you, the the that that this that year, that '96 year, and on the year we went ten to two, our best we we should have beat Florida State. We I think we lost thirteen to nothing mm-hmm. down in Tallahassee when they had their the Ward done and the Peter yep. Ward. But you understand, them boys. They had a tough time crossing the field on, or, yep. against us. War Dunn broke one big run, and you know they got a couple field goals, but we 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 had a tough time moving the ball. But we were we were we were right there again. So it's like it's just it was just like man, we had some tough ones, and um you know it, and I know and then I think my that ninety seven year uh, coach Brown. Went to, uh, took the Texas job mm-hmm. that year, and then we went into the bowl game, and we just beat the smash uh, Virginia Tech that next year. But um, the, the program, even t- t- to this day now, you know, it, it, we, we took some hits, you know, because the rec- we lost control of the recruiting mm-hmm. a little bit over the last few, several years, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think when they brought Coach Brown back, I was always I was always praying that they kind of brought Coach Brown back. But I knew they were bringing Coach Brown back for a purpose, not necessarily to win every game, but to make sure we take back the recruiting to write the ship, to write the ship. And Coach, I mean, I, I guess he got some guys over there now. I would like to say I was just over there. I mean, got some some guys that enrolled in January, some big boys. They all about. 
they all about uh length. They all about <laughs> length over there. So them boys about six, seven, six, eight, six, six freshmen, sophomores, and um he got it, he got it going on the right track. Like I said, that V Tech game, opening game, that's gonna be that's gonna be a measuring point because I think everybody is touting Virginia Tech to be um pretty pretty good this year. <laughs> but that's gonna be a tough place to play. I never actually I personally never played in Blacksburg, I don't think. Um I don't think I ever played in Blacksburg. It's a tough environment, man. You you make a great point, you know, in, in lining up the parallels between your season opener ninety six and this one this year, you know, same coach, same uh verge of of big time, you know, program longevity and success. All right. I, I love how you've couched this. I love being able to hear the frustration in your voice of just getting right there to the precipice in ninety six and ninety seven and and getting so close. Is there any one thing you want to talk about this game? or about Mac Brown before we let you go that, that you feel like our listeners and our viewers need to hear about? Yeah, well, I think, man, if you don't, if they don't know by now, especially our Tar Heel fans, even if you're not a Tar Heel fan, one thing about Coach Brown is Coach Brown is the ultimate, ultimate player's coach. He is the ultimate motivator. He, he's going to get, if you, if you give him, give him everything you got, he's going to give you everything he got in return, but he's going to put you in a place to be successful. He's going to set you up for success, give you an opportunity to succeed. And he doesn't forget about none of his players, mm -hmm. none of his players, whether you're Texas Longhorn, UNC Tar Heel, he doesn't forget about none of the guys. I mean, but, but he's all about preparation. He's all about, you know, putting the work in and he, he doesn't take, he don't believe in shortcuts. Um, Dre Bly, who's coaching over there for him now, and he brought, uh, I think, Nature on Means is back mm -hmm. with him now, which is pretty awesome. You got Tommy Thigpen over there. <clears throat> Coach Browning, I saw him yet. He's still around there. I um, think Daryl Moody is a consultant mm -hmm. around there. So is, I saw Brian Davis. So he got guys that's, um, you know, around the program that's, that, that, that's, that's used to winning, that, that, that knows what it means to be a Tar Heel. Because you got to understand something, you know, that it's a special type of family over there. It's not a four-year decision. It's a 40-year decision. Yes, sir. When you join that program, when you join the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, you better bet you, 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 you're going to bleed blue for the rest of your life. You know what I'm saying? So it, it, there's no – and I told my son the other day, my son plays uh, – he lives in Texas. He's 16 and um, loves to play basketball. So he's all about basketball, basketball. And I told him, I say, you know, son, I, I'm, I'm, I'm behind you 100. percent Whatever school you decide to, you know, if you get an opportunity to get go to school, I said, man, I'm, I, will, I will back you with any school. You can go any school. I'm, I'm behind you 110. Mm percent -hmm. There's only one school I can't back you on though, <laughs> and that's North Carolina State. Look, that's that's that's. I'm gonna follow tell you right now. And I said, I'm now, I, I'm going to go to the games. I'm going to cheer you on to do well, but cheer I'm going you. to hope that you lose. <laughs> I'm going to hope that you lose the game, period. So just, I'm just putting that, I put that out there so he can understand if it ever came down to that, that's not a shock to him or surprise. You know? I love, the, so I I love just, that fatherhood <laughs> wisdom, man. That's, that's just, that is, that is a dad letting his son know how the real world works. <laughs> Well, Mike, we appreciate it, man. It's uh, it's great to talk to you. It's good to good to pleasure, see you, man. Basically. Pleasure. I know our fans and our uh, IC subscribers will be uh, really happy to hear from you as we relive this 1996 season opener against Clemson. But I appreciate you. Uh, you know, thank you. Thanks for having me. Giving us, giving all this uh, insight from from that game. Hope you continue to do well. We appreciate everybody listening. Want to give a big shout out to Johnny T-Shirt for sponsoring, uh, to Tommy Ashley and Lee Pace for joining in the panel session, to Mike Pringley for being here. Uh, you know, Lyndon, New Jersey's own, spending his time to talk with us here on Inside Carolina on the Throwback Season 2, Episode 2. Thank you to John Sigley for producing. We will catch you guys next time down the road. Late. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All Go right, Mike. Yes, sir. Thanks, buddy. We'll talk to you soon.